So chapter one. Uh, in 2022, we're going to see some new language in the Kaiser OPRs and the A&E RFP for plant maintenance work. So in this section, I'm going to review that new language. Um, the main bullet points are assessments and data gathering and analysis and contemporary calculations and then sizing and then options development. So this is what a Kaiser OPR looks like. <clears throat> on page one, we have four sections. There's the scope section, the design and performance outcomes, the key milestones and constraints, and then the project goals. Um, the language that we're reviewing today will be in the design and performance outcomes section of the OPR. Um, we also have updated or created for 2022 some numeric energy goals for plant maintenance work, and so I'll show those uh, later on in the session. We'll talk more about them. So this is the same language uh, given in bullet points so that we can actually walk through it and start talking about it. Uh, task A is assessments, and this is a pretty traditional piece of scope. So we would review equipment data, do a field walk, and then write up an assessment of it. Um, all the items listed here should be in that write up. So it's the age of the equipment, the age of the overall infrastructure, or the physical condition of the equipment, the infrastructure around it. There's reliability, um, which is age and condition, and we can look at some kind of reliability data by equipment type, mean time between failure, or things like that. Um, we should also talk about equipment repair costs and what the replacement parts marketplace looks like, uh, the viability of ongoing service. Um, but this task A, I think we've all seen narratives like this. Um, this is pretty common uh, material. Task B is to gather available data and then use it for assessments. Um, so we always have utility data available, monthly electrical, natural gas, water use, cost, weather metrics, uh, cooling degree days or heating degree days. So at a very minimum, we can calibrate our design ideas to that historical utility data to make sure we're in the right ballpark. Um, we also have 15 minute interval data available. Um, we have to request it, but we always can. We always have weather data available um, if the building has an automation system, we can pull weather data from that. But even if it doesn't have an automation system, there are a couple free readily available websites where you can pull last year's historical weather data for really anywhere in the world. For electrical projects, we require load reading as part of the project. Uh, and then finally, if you have a building automation system, then there's really a whole trove of data that we should be looking at, which we'll talk quite a bit about more later. Uh, bottom line here is that we expect the design to be driven by data. Um, if the building exists, then there is data about it and we need to use it. Um, if that data isn't readily available, then we need to go through the effort to gather it and then use it. Uh, this task C is going to be new for a lot of our design consultants. Uh, most of our design consultants don't include contemporary calculations in their scope. Uh, in fact, I can go ahead and say um, design consultants never include this in their scope until or unless we ask for it. Uh, but the way to think about this is we should not be assuming that the previous design engineer was correct. So someone drew the plans 10 or 15 years ago for the existing building. Um, we are not going to assume that all of their numbers for all the zones were correct uh, and are still valid today. Uh, now, it may turn out that 80% of that work done uh, in the past is is OK and correct, but we're not going to assume that. We're going to actually validate that. So in this step, we would look at the architectural floor plans as if it was a new building and do a set of cooling load calculations, heating load calculations, electrical calculations, ventilation calculations as if it were a new building. So that's what we mean by contemporary design calculations. Uh, if this building did not have a mechanical or an electrical system, what would your calculations look like today? Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to change every airflow in every room, uh, but it does mean that we'll have that to compare the contemporary design calculations to the current state in the building. Um, and then there's going to be zones where we do want to make those changes and we want to be able to go through that uh, in the scoping phase. <clears throat> Task D is equipment sizes and determining equipment sizes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I'll point out that Equipment sizing here is uh, step four on the list, task D on the list, uh, which is to say that equipment sizing is not the first thing that we do. So saying that equipment is sized for replacing kind is never acceptable. 
Um, we want equipment to be sized based on the assessment of existing information and the contemporary design calculations. This is something that comes up time and time again in our scopes, uh, and it's often on the Kaiser side. Our project managers will say in the RFP, replace the boiler with the same size boiler. Um, and so if you get that in your RFP, then obviously that's what you're going to do. And so on the Kaiser side, we're working pretty hard to correct that. And we're not stating um, equipment sizes in the OPR, uh, and so that should flow through into design. Uh, and then the final task of scoping, of scoping is options development. And we like to talk about these as the three R's, repair, refurbish, and replace. Um, for systems or any system component, those are the three things we want to look at. Can it be repaired? How long would a repair extend the life? Is there major refurbishment or a retro commissioning that can happen? Or does it need to be replaced? And if it needs to be replaced, um, are there options? So this is the step where we would do life cycle cost analysis if there's some significantly different options on the table that have significantly different first costs or significantly different downstream costs. Uh, and then this last slide is just a teaser uh, to talk about the design energy targets for plant maintenance. Um, we now have design energy targets for plant maintenance projects, and I'll talk more about this in one of the upcoming sections. So to sum up here on chapter one, the scope of the scoping phase is assessments of existing systems. Those are your traditional physical assessments and availability of parts and repair, all of that kind of thing. Then we gather data about the systems, gather data about the existing buildings, analyze the data about the system, perform a set of contemporary design calculations, then and only then determine the equipment sizes and then develop options for the project. So that's the close of this chapter one. I'll, I'll remind you to type in any questions into the chat box and then we'll move on to section two. What is or are the expectations for what the project managers are going to do regarding these mechanical design requirements besides hiring the mechanical engineer and the commissioning agent? When you say example given, you need to run the design load calculations. Who are you directing that to, given the most PMs are not mechanical engineers? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And um, so there's Kaiser PMs on the line, and and um, and so th this uh, this material that we've gone over today was is really really targeted towards our HVAC design professionals. Um, when we were putting this together. Um, you know, I, I'm using acronyms for cooling degree days and BTU per hour and conversion factors and stuff. And so so basically the target audience for this is I, I am kind of assuming that you have a degree in mechanical engineering and that's what a lot of this is targeted for. Um, for project managers, um, uh, uh, my team is really the internal resource that should be able to translate, you know, design engineering dork into project manager. And so really the tools that we have are our OPR. Uh, to get those requirements out in front of the design engineer. Um, always, always, always feel free to bring one of my design engineers um, into the equation at the time that you're awarding a contract. If you want us to take a look at the scope that somebody's given you and see whether or not it lines up with our OPR, um, we will absolutely do that. If you want us on a selection team um, to see what the firm's capabilities are, we'll absolutely do that. Um, and then we perform our design review. I think all the Kaiser PMs know um, that we have a, a running cadence in the eBuilder, um, usually about twice a month, and we go through and we find all the projects. We look for anybody that's posted a basis of design. My engineer takes that basis of design. It may take us a week or two to turn it around. We post our comments. We'll have meetings with the design engineers. Um, so we really are that line of quality assurance. We do not expect um, project managers to get into you know btu per square foot calcs or watts per square foot calcs um, that's absolutely is this intent that all future retrofit projects including energy engineering services data analytics sorry data analytics and retro commissioning services from the mechanical consultant some firms have different individuals that specialize in these tasks so yes i i, I guess i'm trying to rise the question there. Um, this is kind of going to be our design program playbook. So throughout this, I've told what the what our design program requirements are, and and that'll be 
Um, so within the design phase, um, these requirements are 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 there. And um, so I think where um, the questioner was going was that there are, you know, some firms have energy modeling specialists. Um, some firms use generalists to perform energy modeling. Um, some firms have commissioning folks on staff uh, that can go out and do some field assessments and, and look at BAS data during design. Some firms don't have that. Um, and so those are absolutely the questions that we're that we're frankly talking to people about during interviews. We want to look at the at the capabilities and the resources that the firms have um, to get in, engaged in that type of work or in this type of work. And so um, and we're and that's shaking out differently within the marketplace right now. There's some firms that are um, we know design firms that have data analytics uh, departments, right, where they have people that are doing Python uh, data analytics, you know, as an internal design department within the firm, same way you would have CAD in the old days or something like that. Um, and so um, I, I can't really answer what an ideal. Well, I can. You can call me personally and we can talk about firm composition. I'll tell you what I've seen in the marketplace and where I have some opinions about where I think that are going, but I won't state them here. <laughs> have all Kaiser design engineering firms had this training to understand these requirements? So no, this is actually the rollout of the training. And so we are over the course of this year, we're, we're being very, um, there's, there's a lot of education involved. That's why we want to have the tape of today and make sure that we're able to distribute it and distribute it in sections. Um, this year, I think 2022 is when you're absolutely going to start seeing these requirements in the OPRs that come out of the Kaiser project managers. Uh, but even at that, um, we've already had examples where we send that OPR to a design engineer and ask for a proposal and, and they just miss it. So they're not understanding uh, what we're asking for. And so um, that's absolutely the job of my team to, to do that education. Do the energy targets posted today are for recirculating systems, not 100% outside air systems OA? Will there be energy targets for 100% OA systems? That's a good question, and they are not. Um, they're not differentiated, so they're they're not separate um, targets for 100% outside air systems and um, and recirculated air systems. Um, the good news I can tell you, like the heating target and the cooling target, is that um, we we've, we've seen that level of energy performance in the 100% outside air uh, systems. So uh, that's kind of the weird thing about the energy targets is that we we do know that these are possible. Um, we we've seen them. They they come from our buildings and most Kaiser hospitals. Um, I don't know who asked the question, but you probably know that most of the hospitals that we have in our portfolio are. 100% outside air. So anytime we're looking at historical data, that's what we're seeing. Um, so I, I think where the question was going is, should we have higher energy budgets for 100% outside air systems? Uh, and the answer I would give you is no. The collaboration of the design team, mechanical engineer, controlled engineer, and commissioning agent fees will be significant. Is that a um i don't know that that's a, i don't know that that's a question of uh, do we expect to pay higher fees to design engineers because they collaborate with the commissioning agents do we expect to pay higher fees for commissioning agents um no i don't think so you you can feel free to write that into a line item into your proposal and then we'll select the other guy <laughs> what would be the procedure if no historical data available? Do we rely on the loads calculations only? Um, well, first off, I, what we're talking about here is the playbook for existing buildings. And if it is an existing building that Kaiser owns, there is no scenario where there's no data available. Um, so if nothing else, we have the monthly utility data and we can get that going back 10 years. I mean, so and if that is actually a really big deal uh, just to take a look at the monthly utility load data and sort of compare that. You can take that and divide by the operating hours and see 
whether or not your calculations are within an order of magnitude or 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 inside of range or outside of range. So um, so I would actually kind of reject the question. I, I don't think we have any scenario um, where there is no available data on an existing building. Um, the fact that it, that a building exists uh, in this day and age means that it left a paper trail. And so we can get data on that. I, I don't think there are any utilities that we deal with where we can't get um, interval data at some form either. Um, we can't always get natural gas interval data, but we can pretty much always, and I'm trying to think of an exception, I don't know of one, we can always get um, 15 minute electrical utility interval data. So that, so if you have monthly bills, now you know where your, your building is using on a month to month basis, you can get utility data that tells you what you're doing at midnight and 4 a.m. versus 4 p.m. You can then correlate that to the weather. Um, so if you're looking at a building and you're saying, hey, there's no data here, then, um, you know, there is. You just got to go find it, get it. What type of calculations are required for AHU direct replacement projects when the rooms below are not rebalanced? This is for a packaged unit where the condenser is attached to the unit. So the, um, what we would be looking at is we'd, we'd, we'd look at, um, we'd want to look at the history of the building, particularly utilities, um, whether it's a heat pump or a cooling unit. Um, we'd we'd want to look at the utility information to find out um, how that building is doing uh, relative to weather, find out whether or not we do have a weather correlation or not have a weather correlation and if we don't have a weather correlation that's something that we're going to want to change within the project and so we'll need to find the origin of that and then again you would want to even if you're doing just a, a 10 ton rooftop package unit you'd want to do a contemporary design calculation for that space the contemporary design calculation for that space may tell you that you need 15 tons for that 10 ton package unit or it may tell you that you need five uh, but we would not accept that the previous engineer from 25 years ago um, got it right when he picked the 10 ton rooftop package unit. What's the expected value from energy modeling a building when we are only replacing the AC and not improving the building envelope? Um, so there's so there's two parts to that energy modeling. Uh, and load calculations. One thing that we're asking for in our design program now is a set of, of contemporary design calculations for the building. In other words, take a look at the building and uh, imagine that it doesn't have an HVAC system and do a set of load calculations room by room uh, for that um, as though it was a new building and didn't have an HVAC system. Um, and that set of calculations um, is what we would need to do to, to validate the, the zone by zone basis, right? You may have zone number four over here, and just by doing a contemporary set of calculations, you find that that zone is, is underserved, and so we may need more air in there, we may need less in there, air in there, ventilation, et cetera. Um, so that's what we see as that value of the, the contemporary set of calculations. To take the existing state, whatever whoever designed this 20 years ago and check it against how we would design the building today uh, and find out where those variances are um, in terms of energy models um, I, i'm not personally of the opinion that energy models um, provide a tremendous value so building an energy model in e, e plus or, or something like that uh, for an existing building um, is is dicey business first off you have to calibrate it <laughs> And we've seen calibration can be uh, inaccurate. Uh, and so that's tricky. Um, and then any of the scenarios that you play through it um, have some accuracy problems. So I don't think that's always the right answer. Um, I think a lot of times um, just sort of checking that system at different conditions uh, based on loads or, or based on um, you know, what we can figure out outside of an energy model is, is a better strategy benchmarks be released by KP for consultants to use? Um, so to take that one by one, first off, Clockworks. I think Clockworks has some standard training protocols that they've posted. I, I thought there was a, a web series. I may be mistaken on that, but there, 
but some of the basic user interfaces. Um, if not, that's something we can absolutely do. Um, how to get into Clockworks once you have a password, you know, what are the basic modules of Clockworks and and how would a design engineer click on? That's actually a great suggestion. Um, I think we could do that immediately if it doesn't all already exist. <laughs> so I'll follow up on that. Um, some of the other things, um, like the utility data always comes at us in a very similar spreadsheet form. And so that linear regression um, that we do there, um, that's pretty standard. Um, we already have 30 of those spreadsheets. And so um, I could, I think we'll give those out. I don't know that we're going to post the, that kind of tool on the info zone uh, per se, but I think we'll always be, um, I, I think within my team, um, we're always willing to share any tools that we have that are in Excel or anything else. Uh, and we're willing to share any tools that we steal from the design consultants that do work for us and, or that we pay for the design consultants that do work for us and share those. Um, so please do ask. We probably have uh, we, whatever calculation you're thinking of starting. Um, and if you're just looking at a blank Excel spreadsheet, you know, with cell A1 and you don't know what to do, yeah, please ask. We've probably seen that count before and we can uh, we can show it to you.